And hello, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started now. So welcome to our webinar on atrocity prevention and transitional justice. My name is Sarah Case, and I'm a deputy director of our transitional justice program here at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time, Sites of Conscience is the only global network of historic sites, museums, and memory initiatives that connect past struggles to today's movements for human rights and social justice. Founded in 1999, we now have over 350 members in 65 countries, from Ellis Island in New York City to former centers of detainment in Argentina, to sites that remember and learn from the transatlantic slave trade in West Africa. We support these sites in a variety of ways, including grants, networking, joint programming, and training. In 2014, Sites of Conscience launched the Global Initiative for Justice, Truth, and Reconciliation, or the GIJTR, which is a consortium of nine international organizations focused on offering holistic, integrative, and multidisciplinary approaches to issues of truth, justice, and reconciliation. GIJTR works primarily with local populations, civil society organizations, survivors and governments to develop transitional justice approaches that are victim-centered, collaborative, and support dignity, respect, inclusion, and transparency in societies emerging from conflict or periods of authoritarian rule. Since our founding, GIJTR has engaged with people from 72 countries, worked with 738 CSOs, and has supported 428 community-driven projects and the documentation of more than 6,600 human rights violations. For more information, including how to join our network, please visit our websites at sitesofconscience and gijtr.org. Before I introduce the topic, I'd like to let attendees know that we anticipate this session lasting between an hour and an hour and a half. If you wish to submit a comment or a question, you may do so at any time in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. There will be a designated Q&A session toward the end of the webinar. During that time, you may also raise your hand if uh, you wish to speak and we'll unmute you. If we do go over time slightly, which happens occasionally, uh, please know that this and all of our virtual programming is recorded and made available on our website for future viewing and sharing. If you experience any issues with your internet connection, please try turning off your video, as that can sometimes help. And if you have any further technical problems during the meeting, please reach out to my colleague, who's uh, renamed herself here as Tech Support, or you can email coalition at sitesofconscience.org, and we'll do our best to assist you as quickly as possible. Finally, at the end of each session, you'll be directed to a survey which we would be very grateful to have you fill out as they're crucial to our evaluation and future programming. Okay, um, and with all of those details out of the way, I'd like to welcome you once again to our webinar on transitional justice and atrocity prevention. The linkages between atrocity prevention and transitional justice are significant, but frequently overlooked. The former seeks to prevent genocides, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and ethnic cleansing by identifying specific risk factors for mass atrocity. Transitional justice also places at its center the goals of truth, justice, reconciliation, and non-repetition of past violations, but it's routinely seen as distinct from atrocity prevention because it is considered as mostly backward-looking, given its focus on redress and coming to terms with the past. However, transitional justice mechanisms play a significant role in mitigating atrocity risks by addressing impunity, contributing to institutional reform, allowing spaces for truth-telling, and breaking the silences and distortions around the past. This roundtable will highlight the nexus between transitional justice and atrocity prevention by focusing on the role of psychosocial support, documentation, and archives in upstream prevention, and the need for gender justice and larger prevention efforts. We have four speakers joining us for today's discussion, whom it's my pleasure to introduce at this point. Savita Pandey is a human rights and atrocity prevention advocate. 
She is the executive director of the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect, where she has worked with the UN, governments, and international civil society organizations from around the globe in creating innovative mechanisms to prevent and respond to human rights violations and atrocity crimes. Originally from Bombay, she now lives in New York City. Ana Moyo is a human rights lawyer with 14 years experience working in the legal and human rights fields with a specific focus on legal research, gender, regional litigation, policy making, legislative review and analysis, and the development of continental policies and soft law instruments, including studies, guidelines, and general comments. Anna is currently the executive director at the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation. She has a vision of an Africa that protects and promotes the rights of its citizens, especially women, in all of their diversity and restores the dignity and worth of victims of conflict and gross human rights violations, a continent committed to the peace, development, and well being of its people. Predrag Miletic is a senior legal analyst at the Humanitarian Law Center in Belgrade, Serbia. Predrag is coordinator of the HLC Information Systems, an integral part of which is the War Crimes and Past Human Rights Violations Database. He is a consultant analyst on the Project South Sudan Human Rights Documentation Initiative, and he's also a collaborator on the Project Regional Network of Civil Society Organizations for Reconciliation in the former Yugoslavia, support, support for the establishment of RECOM, and the Kosovo Memory Book. Predra graduated in law at the Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade, and has completed several informal educational courses on oral history, international human rights law, documentation, and managing databases. Velma Sherich is a researcher, journalist, peacebuilding expert, and human rights defender from Sarajevo, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. Velma has around 20 years of work experience and is currently the founder and president of the Post-Conflict Research Center and founder and editor-in-chief of Balkan Discourse. Velma and the Post-Conflict Research Center were awarded the Intercultural Innovation Award by the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, UN Alliance of Civilizations, and the BMW Group. Velma is a Columbia University Fellow, having attended the Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountabilities Fellowship Program. In addition, she is a Fellow of the Robert Bosch Stiftung and the Global Post Ground Truth Project. Uh, welcome to our four panelists. We're really delighted to have all of you here with us today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and begin with our first round of questions. And just as a reminder to our panelists, I'll give you a one minute warning uh, before your time to respond is up for each question. So Anna, my first question will be to you. Uh, one of the key areas in which the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation works is in the provision of mental health and psychosocial support to survivors of conflict and trauma. Based on your experience at CSVR, what role does psychosocial support play in advancing broader transitional justice goals? And how, if at all, does this relate to the, pre the prevention of mass atrocities? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, uh, for this uh, important question. What is the role of uh, mental health and psychosocial support in atrocity prevention? So when we speak of conflict or victimization or victimhood, this comes with a lot of trauma associated with victim suffering, for instance. Um, and it doesn't matter whether you are a direct victim or an indirect victim. By indirect victim, we mean someone who experiences trauma by virtue of being within a society or within a community or family or in the vicinity uh, of atrocity where uh, an atrocity has taken place. So violence or atrocity never really leaves anyone the same. Anyone within that vicinity gets affected somehow and it's a traumatic experience. You get traumatized by seeing, for instance, um, the brutalization, the victimization of those who are direct victims. You get traumatized from hearing about what happened either through social media, through mainstream media, the television, uh, radio, for instance, where you hear about what happened. You also get traumatized, for instance, by just knowing what um, 
uh, prospects are or, or, or how close you are to the to being a victim. So all of this compounds into trauma that then someone feels or experiences. But what we normally don't address, for instance, even in, 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 in processes that seek to address the consequences of violence and conflicts is the actual traumatization that different levels or different types of, of victims are experienced, be it direct victims, people who are direct victims who get victimized or who suffer directly. And those who saw the victimization of others or who belong to a community, even though they may not have been direct victims themselves. So when we don't address this trauma, this trauma morphs into many other manifestations. Uh, if it's left to, to fester, for instance, and it can literally uh, translate into frustration, anger, it can frustrate into uh, physical disorders, uh, psychological disorders, neuro, neuro, uh, uh, neurological disorders, and so forth. So if we don't treat trauma, this then can literally become a catalyst for violence in the future or violence at another setting where this frustration um, that has not been treated or this frustration stemming from trauma now needs an outlet through violence or violent behaviors of a specific person or a community or a group of people who've been left out in the processes. And when we see this happen, for instance, what we usually talk about is intergenerational trauma where the traumatized or the direct victims would have been a certain generation, but the children of the victims, because trauma is really transferable, um, the, 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 the next generation uh, becomes the generation that becomes angrier, that actually manifests this violence, but it's really stemming from the unresolved trauma of their parents or the generation before them. So when we speak of trauma, really the when we don't address it as part of atrocity prevention um, or in the strategies that really seek to prevent atrocity, then we, 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 we risk seeing uh, trauma becoming a catalyst for violence. We risk seeing this trauma playing out into a cycle of violence that is not easily broken. So atrocity prevention strategies really need to address the mental health and psychosocial um, dimensions of victimization, brutalization, and victimhood. So back to the question that you posed, Sarah, what is the role of MHPSS in short uh, in atrocity prevention? It's really important um, because when we have healed individuals, be it direct or indirect victims, then we are able to prevent uh, our violence in the future. We are able to secure peace and sustain it in the long term. Thank you so much, Anna. I think that's a really important point that you make, highlighting how this violence affects not just those who are perhaps physically impacted in the moment, um, but the witnesses, the broader society, and future generations as well. I think that that's a, a crucial point for us to keep in mind. Um, all right, my next question, Pedro, will be to you. The Humanitarian Law Center has worked on documentation of war crimes and human rights violations since 1992. Over the years, the HLC has interviewed 40,000 witnesses and collected hundreds of thousands of documents related to the armed conflict in the former Yugoslavia, including more than 90% of the public archive of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. Based on your experience, why is it important for societies to document and store records related to past human rights violations? And how does this contribute to atrocity prevention efforts? Uh, thank you, Sarah, for this question. And uh, greetings to everybody, to, to panelists and attendees. Uh, well, we simply say documenting and storing, but there are you know, uh, various activities that are in relation, we're speaking about the archives and you know uh, atrocity prevention and transitional justice so uh, in the first place we have to think about various strategies in which we want to use the documentation that uh, we have you know collected and then also we want to think how to preserve this documentation how to convert this documentation in, in a proper format so that it can be you know uh, adapted in a way that it should be, you know, easily accessible, especially to younger, younger generations. And uh, also we want to think about 
how do you want to make some kind of archives that are not accessible to make them accessible, uh, mostly speaking about the archives that belongs to state institutions and that being keep us, you know, uh, in secret because, you know, of, of avoiding responsibility for the past violations. And we also want to think about, for example, how do we want to increase the capacity of civil society organization and the society in whole, you know, to document uh, various atrocities uh, in order to, for, you know, for the atrocity prevention. So uh, speaking about the context in which we work, which is, you know, the Balkan region, uh, we could be a witnesses of very low and undeveloped culture of the memory and especially in the last century when we had, you know, so many conflicts, wars, and, you know, in the, you know, consciousness of, you know, ordinary people, the war comes as something as, as a flood and some kind of natural disaster. So it's a very, very low and weak uh, memory, you know, a culture of the memory. And, um, you know, uh, when the war started in 1919, say, which is the, also, uh, a decade when the Documentary Law Center was uh, founded, you know, with some experiences uh, from the World War II, you know, uh, from which the debates lasted for over uh, four decades, and then again became active with, you know, uh, some nationalist narratives that were, you know, beaten with the fall of the fascist regime again revived and became as main narrative and in the, you know, a situation as that, you know, uh, Human Tarot Law Center and other organizations thought it's, it's very important to document, uh, you know, together with some organizations from the region and to make some kind of uh, alternative or, you know, alternate uh, kind of archives, you know, because the mainstream uh, kind of, uh, you know, narrative was uh, one-sided nationalist and, you know, didn't take into account the uh, war crimes committed towards other nationalities, but only uh, the war crimes committed to towards, you know, their own kind of uh, nationals. So in that work, uh, you already mentioned uh, several of achievements of the Humanitarian Law Center. Uh, so yeah, you know, so many victim statements collected and, you know, uh, victims' families with which uh, interviewers uh, made you know like a conversation over this three de de decades and also uh, a large portion of the uh, archive of the international criminal tribunal which is very very uh, useful i will, will speak a little bit more about it uh, later and also of course you know many many other docu documentation uh, coming from the various uh, activities that humanitarian law center uh, had uh, in these three decades so you know, uh, speaking about the use of the documentation, uh, we always try to use this documentation to establish at, at the first place the historical record because we thought it, it's, it's, it's important then, you know, to, uh, to establish the integrity of the memory as, as a whole, then, you know, to provide ac access to justice for the victims, accountability for the perpetrators, of course. Uh, then, for example, uh, trying to, um, you know, uh, to find out, you know, the, the fate of the missing person, to provide the victims with uh, reparation, uh, restitution, and uh, to use this documentation for the education and other purposes. So we always try to, to work uh, in compliance with, uh, you know, international standards, because all, you all know that the term transitional justice actually showed up in the uh, mid nineties. And, you know, we try to, to follow, you know, and to comply with all of this, uh, which has, what, what has been, you know, developed in a sense, you know, and, um, you know, uh, I, I hope that, you know, attendees would be able to read in the policy paper that was prepared by the Humanitarian Law Center, and it's called the archives, the role of the archives in atrocity prevention, that uh, there are many international standards and principles that uh, actually address the archiving. And uh, for example, five out of the 40 uh, principles of how to promote uh, the human rights in fight uh, with, uh, against the punity from 1997, uh, five out of the 40 main principles actually address 
the archiving, you know, and awareness uh, of, you know, state institution uh, that they should, you know, pay much more attention to the archiving uh, process. Then also the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, also have uh, their reports in which uh, they are also addressing the archiving. Uh, uh, and, you know, there's a Memory of the World archive, for example, uh, that also gathers the archives from uh, some, you know, documentation from the Latin America state, and there is also some other compilation of archives uh, coming out lately that also includes archive coming from, you know, some uh, authoritarian regimes like, you know, that one that, that existed in, in Russia and, of course, exists now. But, you know, uh, for the first question, this is just, uh, I want to just to stress the importance of the archive, you know, in that role, because the archive and documentation uh, in transitional justice and also in atrocity prevention is the base, actually, for all the other activities that are orientated towards, you know, preventing future future crimes and atrocities. Thanks. Thanks so much, Peja. I think you really highlighted how, um, you know, as we said, this, the documentation, the organization, and the preservation of these statements is really the first step um, in future truth-telling educational justice efforts. And once the, the information is there and organized, it can then be used for a range of different purposes related to atrocity prevention, education, combating nationalist narratives. So thank you for sharing that. Um, my next question, Savita, will be for you. The Global Center exists to uphold the norm of the Responsibility to Protect, or R2P, which aims to ensure that the international community never again fails to halt the mass atrocity crimes of genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity. As part of this work, you also analyze what goes wrong when these failures do take place and mass atrocity crimes are committed. Based on your research, what links do you see between failed transitional justice processes and risk factors for atrocity crimes? Oh, I think you're still muted, Svita. <laughs> there we go. I still haven't gotten it right after three years. Um, good morning, everyone, and it's so nice to be here. And thank you so much uh, for inviting me to be part of this very excellent panel. Um, I think, Sarah, I'll build upon what you said at the beginning very much that, you know, the link between atrocity prevention and transitional justice, that atrocity prevention is something about looking to the future or predicting the likelihood of crimes, whereas transitional justice is a process which looks, um, you know, to the past. And, um, you know, to answer sort of your first question, the Global Center does look at the world from a lens of atrocity uh, crimes. And, and some of the risk factors that I'll talk a little bit more about are sort of, you know, weak state, state structures that are un unable to um, provide protection, systematic violations of human rights, um, you know, discriminatory policies against uh, particular groups. Um, you know, systematic and institutionalized gender discrimination, um, extreme poverty can similarly be a, a driving force as a lack of opportunities, lack of resources and gross inequalities within society can drive uh, intergroup grievances, particularly the differences between haves and have nots. Uh, appear to be identity based uh, armed conflict and sort of final culture of impunity and what we have consistently seen is um, impunity begets begets impunity um, so uh, you know taking the example of Myanmar where um, the the clearance operations um, the genocide against the Rohingya and the clearance operations which took place in 2017 which drove over 700,000 Rohingya uh, from uh, um, uh, Myanmar into Bangladesh um, it was not a process which started 
uh, you know, or was completed in a day or in a month. Uh, it was a process which was a long-term process which started decades earlier with discriminatory policies towards a certain group. Um, you know, we see we saw an environment created um, within Myanmar which was permissive towards uh, commission of violence against the Rohingya community, and it all culminated in a genocide. And we did not see much reaction from the international community. Human rights groups like um, the Global Center were consistently warning the international community from 2012 onwards when we saw very stark risk factors come into place um, for the Rohingya that there would likely be mass violence against this particular uh, group. And there was no action taken, and it was just sort of this lens of democracy promotion, um, which was adopted by most of the international community. And then you have the clearance operations in 2017. Um, you know, thousands died, uh, rampant sexual and gender-based violence, and then 700,000 Rohingya ethnically cleansed from uh, Myanmar. And then we see two years later, the Myanmar military dismisses the elected parliament and you know, it's, there's a coup. And now what we are seeing is again, um, you know, the Myanmar government is committing uh, atrocities against its own people. So the Myanmar example sort of very clearly shows that impunity begets impunity. If we consistently ignore justice and sort of um, adopt policies that are about democracy from promotion or conflict resolution, we create conditions um, which can lead to uh, recurrence of atrocities, which can lead to just commission of atrocities. So going beyond that to sort of look at, um, you know, what, what also contributes. So the, I mean, as I said, the intersection between atrocity crimes and transitional justice. From uh, uh, transitional justice processes, as you very much said at the, the beginning of the conversation, should be holistic. They should be about, um, you know, a, a, a way that is uh, that transforms a particular society, that inculcates trust, creates guarantees for non-recurrence. And that can only happen if we look at justice in a, in a very broad sense. So that means sort of how Pedrek talked about, um, you know, archiving to Anna's points about addressing psychosocial impacts of atrocities. And that also includes individual uh, criminal responsibilities. We have seen in some cases like Argentina, where some of these facets were, um, you know, the criminal in, uh, responsibility sort of played out in a certain way. Uh, whereas other transitional justice processes lack one uh, element versus the other. In Yugoslavia, we are seeing, you know, the, the, the failures around truth telling and sort of more of a, a whole of society approach to transitional justice. And in the context of the international community and what is happening right now to remedy some of these things are, um, I would say the one the one point is about sort of where we are not seeing much action is Myanmar and Syria uh, in terms of sort of um, you know action towards protecting populations. But what we have seen is creation of mechanisms like um, independent investigative mechanism on Syria or double I double M on Myanmar, which is basically about collecting evidence for possible future prosecutions. So that is again a, a way in which the international community is contributing towards transition justice. And this is where sort of the, the link comes into place because creation of these mechanisms was not a deep, like it was not a, um, it was essentially a political process because what, what you're doing is that you are saying to perpetrators that we have an eye on you. So this is where sort of the atrocity prevention and transitional justice or justice and accountability intersect. The other sort of mechanism which the international community consistently uses is investigative mechanisms. And these are sort of fact-finding missions, commissions of inquiries, um, who, who are creating, whose job is to collect evidence on um, individual responsibility, but very much it is about creating a narrative of a particular situation. So what is happening currently, um, establishing the fact of a particular situ situation or sort of historical evidence. And the idea is that because this is an international independent body, um, these facts will hold in the future. So what we saw with Myanmar was that, you know, you have a fact-finding mission report which comes out and it says that, no, 
the acts of genocide were committed against the Rohingya. And on the basis of that report, we see Gambia taking Myanmar to court, uh, to the International Court of Justice, and saying that Myanmar has violated its obligation under the Genocide Convention. So these are some of these different ways where we see uh, intersection between commission of atrocity crimes or the atrocity crimes sort of um, policies, uh, prevention of atrocity crimes policies versus transitional justice that you know, while atrocities are occurring, it's not as if we are only going to do transitional justice or look at justice and accountability when the, once the crisis is over. It's about looking at these processes, collecting evidence, establishing the fact of the situation while atrocities are um, occurring. Many of these mechanisms, what they also do is that they are preventive tools, not that the perpetrators stop committing atrocities. So in the case of Venezuela, what we have seen is that the, the government is continuing to uh, commit atrocities, is continuing to, uh, you know, uh, do uh, extrajudicial killings and, you know, arbitrary detentions at a massive scale. But with the fact that there is a fact-finding mission which exists there, they know that there is international scrutiny. So just the scale of it is is not as uh, as intense at, as it could have been. Uh, in Yemen, on the other hand, what we saw was that we had a group of eminent experts, which was um, looking at violations which are being committed by the Saudi coalition, as well as by the Houthis and all the parties to the armed conflict there. Um, and this was the sort of the only UN body which was looking at uh, Yemen and, you know, creating sort of a, um, monitoring the, the different um, international humanitarian law violations. And then, um, and, and this is again, like this is where the power of these kinds of mechanisms, uh, you know, we see it very starkly that in the September of 2021, Saudi Arabia as well as uh, UAE really put up a huge uh, advocacy campaign with the rest of the membership and uh, uh, you know, put pressure on them to eliminate uh, the, 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 the group of eminent experts. And what we saw was at the moment... Just that one minute left, Savita, sorry to interrupt. No, no worries. So what we saw was that the moment the group of eminent experts, this, this mechanism was eliminated, there was an 85% increase in the violations, um, in humanitarian law violations in Yemen between October 2021 to March 2022. So I just wanted to sort of create a bit of a background about the connection between atrocity crimes and transitional justice processes, because, you know, when we talk about transitional justice, it's a very broad mechanism and the role that international mechanisms very much play is to look at um, what is happening and, and monitoring and, and so I'll stop there but I hope that answered your question. No thank you so much Savita for for bringing in all of those contemporary examples and I think you know you really highlighted that these atrocity crimes they don't happen overnight they're part of broader cycles and at least I, I know in the work that we do at the GIJTR we don't think of transitional justice processes just as backward looking. We also think of them, as you mentioned, I'd say, as opportunities to kind of think about reforms and envision what changes need to take place in a society so that the future generations, there can really be this respect for the human rights of all citizens and um, the breaking of these cycles that keep impunity and, and violence recurring. Uh, so thank you for that. My um, my next question, Velma, will be for you. Uh, so the Post-Conflict Research Center is dedicated to fostering a culture of peace and preventing violent conflict in the Western Balkans through evidence-based, multidisciplinary, and innovative approaches to peace education, conflict prevention, human rights, and transitional justice. Could you please speak about your educational programs and how you link learning about past violations to efforts to build a more peaceful future in your context? You're still muted. Sorry, Velma. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you go. so much, Sarah, and thank you so much for the invitation and organizing this seminar. Well, looking back at the genocide and war that took place in Bosnia and the region of Western Balkans in the 90s, we do really have a benefit of seeing clearly how step by step the policies, plans and actions leading to genocide are constructed and how we did learn how better to equip our, our society with the skills, knowledge, and tools necessary to prevent these events happening in the future. 
from the perspective I do at the Post-Conflict Research Center and the work we do also in the region of Western Balkans, initiative most important from preventive perspective have to include a multi-perspective perspective history teaching and human rights education, also comprehensive and innovative remembrance and memorization efforts, and the use of new technologies and new medias and opportunities such, a, such as multimedia technologies and social media applications. The majority of work we do is a youth and peace education, working with the young people from Bosnia and regionally. And we do know that now in a recent period, young people are mostly spending their time on social media. So we are looking into possibilities also to come closer to them and find new ways and new technologies to approach those young people too. At this moment, uh, all this is lacking in Bosnia, in our region, and even 25 years after the end of the war, we have not been able to move uh, from one way or one-sided history teaching perspective. Uh, probably you do know that we have three different conflicting narratives and device narratives in schools. Um, Bosnia is still uh, uh, having this pure phenomenon of segregation. Uh, which is two schools under one roof where uh, kids uh, from different ethnic groups, they physically do go together in the same building, but they are separated through educational curriculum and classrooms, and they don't even have a chance to spend some time and interact between each other during the school breaks. According to recent OSC report, there's 56 schools in 28 locations through Bosnia uh, with this uh, uh, two schools under one roof phenomenon. So when we are mentioning all these issues and problems uh, regarding uh, the fact that what we can do now as a civil society and non-governmental uh, organization is uh, informal education, which is actually uh, non-formal education, we are still not allowed it to go into uh, classrooms and teach peace, peace, peace education in classrooms. So majority of work we do is non-formal education. And we, as a post-conflict research center, are trying to create a new innovative approaches and educational curriculums that do promote the study of moral and civic courage, uh, peace and inter-ethnical dialogue among youth. Uh, and we are trying also to highlight the role of individuals, positive uh, people or stories who do bring positive change in, their, uh, in, in communities uh, through the country. Um, I'm going to mention uh, one of our probably the most important uh, uh, leading project and program, which we run now over 10 years. It have a name, uh, Ordinary Heroes. It does promote stories of moral courage and rescue behavior or those individuals and people who during the war and genocide, they're crossing ethnic boundaries and they were helping to save life of, of others. Um, we do teach a moral courage and rescue behavior among young people. Also, uh, through this program, we are not focusing our work only on uh, Bosnia or Balkan. We are incorporating stories of moral courage from Holocaust or from Cambodia and Rwanda, trying to also provide young people with a larger global approach towards certain, towards certain issues. Uh, with the ordinary heroes, I'm going to mention proudly our um, uh, our uh, now official toolkit of Council of Europe for 56 countries of, 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 of Europe uh, uh, should, being featured as the best uh, practice of uh, uh, how to teach or how to organize interethnic and interreligious dialogue. Um, this program uh, we did run now uh, for uh, more than 10 years and we were able to reach uh, around 15,000 uh, youth, uh, majority 10,000, around 10,000 are in Bosnia, but we are counting that through some other programs and educational programs we are running, like Srebrenica Youth School, for example, which is seven days long program. We are running at the Srebrenica, uh, together with Srebrenica Genocide Memorial, where we are bringing young regional people uh, to spend one week in Srebrenica and also learn through set of workshops and uh, multimedia uh, 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 content and different lectures about genocide prevention, also transitional justice and human rights. So uh, we are trying to incorporate as much we can uh, multimedia and uh, 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 a storytelling, visual storytelling by allowing young people to have a chance to uh, 
be exposed to those stories without trying to influence their opinion uh, or trying to impose any opinion about what happened in the recent past, but allowing them to, through individual stories, stories of victims or stories of survivors, they have a chance to actually learn and bring their own conclusions and their own experiences from these programs. I'm going to mention briefly, I don't know how good I am at the time, but I'm going to mention briefly also Balkan Discourse, which is our pan-ethnic multimedia platform for the youth journalists, young people through the country. Um, this is a, a program, seven days long program, where we are gathering young people through the country to learn about basic techniques of um, citizenship journalism and also photography and documentary photography. Um, after they finish this long, seven days long uh, journalistic training, they, we send them back to their communities and through special mentorship program, they continue to work with us um, on creating their own content, finding their own stories. And this is one way of us engaging young people and providing a, a platform for young people where their voices can be heard without censorship, without trying to impose any opinion and giving them also opportunity for a larger visibility. I'm going to probably mention briefly that we have been able also to touch formal education with a special multimedia program uh, with the name Holocaust and Peace. In the last six years, PCRC with, uh, with, with the partners was working with a group of teachers, professors through the country from all ethnic and religious groups. Creating One this minute, Velma, sorry. Yeah, creating this educational manual of 15 different lessons or modules, um, uh, touching, of course, the lessons of Holocaust and also uh, uh, creating the manual and teaching material about memorization, human rights, breaking the stereotypes, minorities. And uh, this manual and this book uh, now is officially from the January this year is officially the part of curriculum of Sarajevo Canton, which have more than 400,000 pupils uh, yearly. And this is for us a large success of actually penetrating a, a formal education, which in reality is our like larger goal and what we are hoping to achieve so that we can definitely work more on prevention and that we can you know, uh, educate the future generation so that that we, we don't repeat a uh, 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 recent past here. So I stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Velma. I really um, love this idea of ordinary heroes that you shared. Um, and I think that you've you've highlighted how work with youth is really one of the key areas where we see these two fields atrocity prevention and transitional justice come together. Um, you know, I think you've, you've spoken to how memory and educational work, which we might traditionally associate with transitional justice, can also really play a role in sharing multiple perspectives and hopefully um, broadening the views of, of young people to prevent these crimes from recurring, as you said. So thank you for that. Um, now I'll turn back, Anna, to you with the next question. So CSVR recently wrote a policy brief for the GIJTR on the topic of wounded leaders and wounded leadership. Uh, could you please explain this concept and its relevance to both the fields of transitional justice and atrocity prevention? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so when we look at wounded leadership or, uh, yeah, wounded leadership or wounded leaders, we are looking, uh, for instance, at the role of leadership uh, in either catalyzing violence um, or leading, for instance, uh, to catalyze or to be a contributor to violence um, within, within a society or within an institution. So when we look at wounded leadership or wounded, um, wounded leaders, we are looking at um, a situation whereby the unresolved trauma, for instance, or the woundedness of leaders, or the trauma stemming from some of their past experiences um, with trauma can easily morph into harmful ways of addressing their own leadership responsibilities and their own leadership responses to those that they lead, for instance. So in instances where leaders are wounded, um, there is a need for leaders to undergo a process uh, of dealing with their own trauma first before they can effectively lead um, a nation or an institution uh, that is usually also traumatized. We speak of a number of African countries, for instance, being traumatized because of what they have gone through, stemming from as far back as colonialism, 
uh, slavery, the slave trade, the number of conflicts that we've experienced on the African continent. So all of these are traumatic events. As I said earlier, they leave the societies uh, where they okay. Uh, they don't leave the societies the same. They don't leave communities where they okay the same. People are affected and are traumatized. So leaders are supposed to, uh, for instance, deal with their own trauma by virtue of belonging to a society that has undergone a traumatic experience or that has undergone brutalization and violence before they can effectively lead such a traumatized institution or society or a company or even an organization or even a nation, for instance. So this is how leaders then can contribute to managing a traumatized workplace. Unless they work through their own trauma, then they will be leading from their own woundedness. And when they lead from their own woundedness, it means that their responses to conflict, their responses to misunderstandings or anything that can easily escalate into conflict or uh, a dispute in the workplace, then the way they resolve those, in, those incidents would be from their own wound. So it would easily escalate to a traumatic, to a violent uh, 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 um, experience. And when we are dealing with political leaders specifically on the African continent, this is part of our legacy, particularly countries that have undergone um, uh, uh, colonization and many other conflicts that we've experienced on the African continent. Our legacy is this. We have leaders who have also been brutalized, victimized. Um, some have been direct victims of conflicts um, and of this violence at a grand scale, but they have not gone through a process of addressing or dealing with their own traumatization. So we have heroized our leaders. We've put them in positions of power, but we've not supported them or provided platforms for them to deal with their own trauma. So when they are leading and they are facing incidents of violence or disputes, or when they are being blamed, for instance, by societies that they lead uh, for, for inadequacies and some of the excesses of the government and many other uh, um, events that may easily uh, aggravate um, communities and societies, then they are, they are, the leading from the wound in courts that I speak about then would gravitate towards violence. So their responses will be violent. Um, they, are, they are ways of addressing the outbursts or the, 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 the insurrection or the violence that they see on the ground, the viol from violent, violent protests or many other manifestations of violence or any aggravation would be violent. So they, they don't lead uh, from, uh, a, a, from their understanding of what trauma is. So you have a situation whereby the society is traumatized, the communities are traumatized, and the leader is traumatized. And when you bring all of that trauma together in a response and in a in a in a in a in a in an um um in a in, in an issue-based uh, approach where communities are approaching leaders with their grievances, they are frustrated, nothing is happening, they are becoming violent, and the leader, on the other hand, also becomes violent in response. This can easily uh, 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 um, uh, be scaled up into a, a, a violent confrontation or insurrection or violence or even conflict. Um, um, and, and we have seen this in a country like South Africa, where due to the unresolved trauma of the past within society, what we speak of as collective trauma, because we have the whole society, whole communities that have um, unresolved trauma, that have not resolved the trauma of the past. And you have leaders as well whose trauma has not been resolved. And the response from a response and a grievance perspective, uh, everything is violent. And this easily blows up into the violence that we see that is that becomes, uh, that escalates so quickly. And we end up with uh, people dying are within this outburst of violence from both sides. We see, for instance, um, new victims coming uh, or surfacing, and we see this trail of, 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 of violence and traumatization and victimization um, now literally being the consequence of this unresolved trauma, particularly from leadership. But where you have leaders who have resolved their own traumatization or who have gone through processes to deal with their own trauma, when they face violent outbursts or violent uh, 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 responses or, or grievances from, the, from society, 
or from the people, the citizens that they lead, then their responses will be towards peacemaking. So they will be leading from peace as opposed to leading from violence or leading from their wound. So if they are healed, they're able to separate issues, they're able to really sit down with people and facilitate a more peaceful ways of engaging and addressing the violence that may be stemming up uh, from the ground and really finding more peaceful ways of dealing with the issues, the real issues, by the way, that may be coming from those who are governed. But the opposite, as I have highlighted, is also very true. So when leaders are not healed, it means One that minute, the very Anna. institutions that they lead. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. It means that the institutions that they lead, uh, which, which are traumatized, um, then also do not benefit from processes that are more peaceful or approaches that are more peaceful towards resolving whatever issues that may be emanating. So this is basically the whole concept of wounded leadership and wounded leaders and the need for addressing the trauma uh, that leaders present with in order to build institutions and societies that are more peaceful. Thank you so much, Anna, for, for sharing this really powerful idea with us. And I think, um, you know, as Savita highlighted in her comments earlier, these atrocity crimes, these conflicts don't uh, just happen out of nowhere. They're part of broader cycles. And when thinking about intergenerational trauma, even stemming back to, as you said, the, the colonial period or even before with the transatlantic slave trade in Africa. Um, so I think it's it's quite interesting to think about how transitional justice mechanisms, uh, when interpreted in a holistic sense, including psychosocial support, can really be used to kind of break some of these cycles and provide collective healing to a society or to leaders, as you've said, uh, to prevent violence from occurring. So thank you for that. Um, for my next question, uh, Pejo, we'll turn back to you. Could you please speak to the role of human rights archives in building a culture of memory grounded in truth and justice? And how can this archival work help to prevent historical revisionism and ultimately the recurrence of atrocity crimes? Yeah, thank you, Sarah. So I may say, and this, this is one of two, I think, main points that's been highlighted in the policy paper that uh, uh, archiving uh, two purpose, main purposes is, you know, to uh, help future generation uh, at first I, I identify atrocity, actually, you know, in, in the documentation and learn to recognize, as, as Velma said, you know, about the, you know, steps that led, for example, to the, the genocide. And uh, second is definitely to prevent revisionism and denial. Uh, I will just now briefly a little bit elaborate again this, uh, what we are witnessing in, in, uh, in, in the context of uh, uh, exclusively Serbian uh, context, because uh, as one of my colleagues said yesterday, we had a call with some of the representatives from the Ukraine, and one of them said that you, you were lucky that you had for example, international criminal tribunal for the you know former Yugoslavia, and uh, in fact that he was true. It was it's, it's a true because uh, a large number of documents became available, and it wouldn't be available without you know having that uh, tribunal. And also, as Savita said, I want to reference her. So maybe our work of you know humanitarian law center and other uh, organizations that done that were you know doing the documenting during the 90s and after the wars have ended isn't you know so much significant but without that work it would be definitely much much uh, harder and there would be you know much uh, more victims you know because uh, we are uh, we're aware that you know they have been tracking our work definitely and there are lots of examples of that for example they're using our body count for the Kosovo conflict and, and their speeches in front of the Security Council. So, you know, they're using the numbers from the agency and at the same time, they are ignoring our work. So, you know, it's important that they should, you know, if for the uh, preventing the future trust disease, it's important that they need to know that a certain, you know, part of the society would react in a, in a way, you know, that they would docu document or that they would, you know, tomorrow uh, do the ed education or that they will, you know, do the analysis of this, what happened uh, or what Anna said, you know, uh, uh, you know, that, that there will be uh, described as wounded, you know, uh, I don't want to say sick, but okay, let's say wounded. Uh, so, yeah, just to get back into this subject, so having the 
the archive of the International Criminal Tribunal helped us a lot uh, later you know, to do our document, documenting work because uh, many of the police and military documents that, you know, in a normal circumstances, would, uh, they wouldn't be available to the broader public. They were available and we used that documentation to to uh, fill out the criminal complaint, complaints and fill out the dossiers on uh, possible perpetrators of war crime and, you know, use this documentation for writing the Kosovo memory book narratives and many other, uh, for many other uh, purposes. And still, you know, there is a lot of documentation that's yet not uh, accessible and available. We know that this uh, documentation exists and there is a danger that, you know, this documentation could, you know, stay outside of, you know, uh, to stay some kind of, you know, uh, like classified uh, as a state secret, uh, which, you know, is totally unjustified because, the only purpose of keeping this documentation uh, classified is, you know, just avoiding individual responsibility. Uh, so uh, at the same time, what we are facing here uh, in Serbia is, uh, especially in the late, late uh, in last five years, let's say it's a uh, increased activity on uh, printing uh, uh, alternative history, like nationalist kind of narrative, books, uh, TV shows, TV debates, uh, you know, uh, so kind of, you know, inviting the war criminals to be the uh, guests in, you know, TV talk shows and, you know, all the kind of uh, things that, you know, the, it, the purpose of all of those things is to create a narrative for younger population to, to normalize some kind of, you know, the narrative that, you know, we were the victims, other, you know, other are, were, you know, aggressive towards us. So that in the, in the situation of a possible future conflict, and chance, you know, to regain some of, you know, like uh, territories or, you know, uh, to to have, you know, like a situation to, you know, uh, get back on some national interest so that you, you have a public prepared for that narrative to justify those kind of policy, which is, you know, of course, something that we are fighting against with documenting, you know, the facts as they really happen. So this is why we believe that, you know, the facts which definitely cannot be overlooked and cannot be minimized because you know simply they are you know the truth they are recorded uh, and you know but again you know in spite of all of that work that we had in the last uh, decades still the situation isn't looking so bright uh, and we still have to you know keep fighting and we are uh, facing. Uh, many challenges, challenges in archiving, uh, you know, just for example, you know, to keep the mirror archive of the International Tribunal requires much, much uh, space, much equipment, much uh, servers, uh, hardware, softwares, and other, and other things, you know, so uh, if, for example, if happening that we, you know, lack some uh, funds for, for that purpose, it, we might lose, lose, you know, everything that we have, you know, and, uh, you know, also we need space to uh, keep this archive, uh, to organize archive, and, uh, you know, uh, I would just, you know, uh, highlight also as a benefit, I definitely think that uh, it's very been, uh, very much been useful in uh, this process is actually this cooperation that we have between each other in scope of the uh, consortium JTR, but also regionally and, you know, uh, meeting all the other people, exchanging experience, and hearing, you know, uh, like in this occasion, that there are so much similar uh, challenges that we are all One facing minute, and teacher. learning then, you know, learning now how to, to you know, face this problem and, and challenges is uh, actually a benefit. And now it's much harder for the, you know, you know, potential future uh, crimin war criminals, uh, you know, to, to plan this kind of things, knowing that people are being more uh, connected than before, that, you know, information could be revealed more easily and brought to light than it was before. So it's it's much harder to, to hide. Uh, but again, not all the regions in the world are being treated equally, as we know, you know, Yemen, as I mentioned, and some other countries are still being in the dark and uh, far from, you know, the spotlight. So, you know, these are just, you know, just a few, few of things that I just wanted to highlight and happy to answer any questions that attendees might have later. Thanks. Thanks so much, Peja. And I, I really like this um, idea that you shared that it's just important to know that people are paying attention. So, uh, you know, I think 
that even if uh, there are challenges or gaps in transitional justice processes that have taken place, or we even see some backwards movement in relation to historical revisionism, um, just the idea that civil society is doing this documentation work, is working to combat those narratives. I think that in itself, um, when we're thinking about risk factors, can really be a deterrent for future atrocity crimes. So, so thank you for sharing that idea. Um, for my next question, Savita, we'll return to you. Rape and sexual violence are often used as a deliberate weapon of war to terrorize and humiliate and destroy the social fabric of entire populations. How can policymakers, whether within or outside of formal transitional justice processes, advance accountability for these crimes and prevent them from recurring? No, thank you, Sarah, for that question. And it's really amazing to be uh, part of this panel because from Predrag, Valma, and Anna, there's so many different perspectives on, on how we think about atrocity prevention, how we think about documentation, and, and the, the various roles that civil society can play in um, you know, providing guarantees for non-recurrence. Um, so coming back to the question that you've asked me, uh, no, you're absolutely right. Um, sexual and gender-based violence, I mean, what we are seeing across the board, um, you know, and again, you know, bringing in contemporary cases, I think that, you know, uh, the conflict in uh, and the atrocities committed in the former Yugoslavia were a very stark reminder to the world that how sexual and gender-based violence is just not a byproduct of war, but rather a tactics, a tactic used by different um, parties to the conflict. And that's what we have seen right now in Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, DRC. I mean, the list is just, um, the, the list is very, very long. And I think that like one important point to bring into this discussion is also the fact that, um, you know, atrocity crimes are essentially gendered. So it's not just about sexual and gender-based violence. It's about, you know, looking at atrocity crimes in general and looking at that everything has a gendered, uh, 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 you know, so when we're looking at early warning to response to accountability, we have to take into account gender narrative. I mean, what happened in Srebrenica, it is, you know, it's 8,000 men and boys who were killed. So what we see, it's not only just women and girls, but across the board, uh, each of the different genders uh, that we have experience atrocities differently. And the experience of each gender of atrocity crimes is different. How our trauma plays out, all of that, that is gendered because, you know, we are essentially, we live in a gendered world. So, um, and, you know, when we talk about accountability for, uh, you know, crimes that are committed against women and girls or sexual and gender based violence, because we generally sort of equate these two, we also have to think about the fact that, um, you know, thinking in terms of accountability begins uh, in thinking about prevention, because uh, prevention or sort of accountability or um, the way we look at in the transitional justice processes begins during the time of peace. How uh, different genders will experience atrocity crimes begins during, um, uh, you know, uh, times of, uh, of of peace. Um, I mean, and in, you know, with, uh, and as I said, you know, commission of atrocity crimes is a process. So what we have seen from Germany to former Yugoslavia to Ethiopia to um, many other uh, situations is that when you see sort of, you know, high increase, like incre a, a rising increase in the possible commission of atrocity crimes, we also see an increase in heteronormative cis discourses. We see increase in um, how we uh, hate speech against women, human rights defenders, women journalists. So it's all part and parcel of a process where you start demonizing either a gender, either a particular community, you start demonizing LGBTQ UAI because it's about sort of this robust nationalistic narratives. And that's what we're also seeing. I mean, as Pedrag said, that like now you're seeing the rise of it in different ways in um, former Yugoslavia. So, so all of these sort of factors of how we look at gender, how we look at different parts of the population during peacetime, then affects how um, it plays out during the times of war or during the times when atrocities, uh, the commission of atrocities is underway. 
Now, what can we do to um, be better at this? I think the first thing we start with is that um, we really address during peace time and even at the, you know, with the help of the international community, while atrocities are ongoing, institutional and legislative mechanism that can address um, commission of sexual and gender based. What start by is that we give uh, women prominent positions, we give women uh, public positions, uh, we involve community leaders, we involve uh, women from the community to make sure that their narratives and their uh, experiences of atrocity crimes are taken into account when we are establishing the fact of the situation. So that again means in the fact-finding missions, in the commissions of inquiry, in the archiving that we do, how we are collecting evidence is all from a gendered perspective and puts uh, the experiences of different genders very much front and center. Um, there are other sort of ways in which we can think about this is also sort of um, you know, during times of peace and even, you know, post uh, conflict, because it's all a cycle, it's not really a linear process, um, is that uh, we make the prosecution of, of uh, you know, gendered violence um, a priority, because in most cases, what we have seen is that, especially with sexual violence, that's really not a priority for um, in, in many of the post conflict situations. Um, I mean, currently, what we are seeing with um, and even though I'm saying talking about all of these best practices, what we see in most situations that, as it plays out, recently the Ethiopian government signed a, a peace agreement with the Tigrayan um, uh, TPLF and um, you know with the Tigrayan authorities. And even though the peace process is playing out in a uh, you know in the in the right ways, what we are seeing is an absence of taking very holistically into account um, you know sexual and gender based violence which was committed you know, very, very rampantly in this conflict. Um, and if we, address this, if we don't address this, it will just keep on perpetuating the, the trauma as well as, you know, you know, consistently um, will not sort of provide us with the guarantees of non reference So again, coming back to uh, sort of how we can think about accountability processes is to very much, uh, there are so many different best practices out there, but it is very much about centering gendered narrative and, and which go beyond just, um, you know, sexual violence, but really centering gendered narratives in how we think about accountability, how we think about collection of evidence, how we think about creation of narratives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Savita. And as you said, I think, um, you know, it's really the ways in which we deal with, uh, with these narratives, with these reforms during times of peace or during times of transition, that ultimately lay the groundwork for either the prevention um, or the recurrence of, of conflict and atrocity crimes. Thank you for that. Um, so now my, my last question, Velma, will be to you. On a similar note, um, the Post-Conflict Research Center also implements programming to combat a culture of impunity around conflict-related sexual violence. How does this work contribute to the broader promotion of gender justice within today's society? Uh, thank you, Sarah. Yes, I mean, a, a majority of work we were doing uh, also is related to preventing genocide and mass atrocities, including uh, preventing sexual violence in conflict. Well, the issues of gender equality and women empowerment are not prioritized in our dominant political agendas, to be honest, in BIH, in the whole BIH. Um, and the, mar the marginalization of uh, women uh, in the public process has really led to deficit of effective female uh, role models, especially for young people and for those who are willing to, in to initiate social change. In this such environment, uh, this can create a severe uh, issues, especially for the youth and the future generation. But I mean, this primarily uh, relates to unique challenges which are facing the victims of war times and other forms of sexual violence. Uh, female survivors of wartime rape and sexual violence generally felt that state neglects them completely, their resistance, and they are trying to avoid addressing their responsibility over them. And many uh, other issues are uh, related to wartime victims, and they still um, remain unsolved uh, all these years after the war. You probably know, but I will repeat, in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, rape was used as a weapon of war on a massive scale. 
Um, there are, uh, according to European investigative team, uh, which was estimated that between April 92 and 93, some 20,000 Bosnian women were raped. Some other data, including the UN data, goes up to 50,000. So with this uh, large number of women who went through uh, a sexual violence and rape, you can imagine um, how difficult it is for the victims of sexual violence to coexist in our society. Um, there is also very well known that Bosnia was a place where numerous reports also did alluded on establishment of rape camps. And this is, uh, you know, quite, quite well known, but I'm going to speak a little bit about these multimedia and, 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 and educational initiatives and programs and projects which we were trying to first create, uh, I would say 12 years, uh, 12 years ago, 10 years ago, first with the aim to stop the impunity for perpetrators and promote the legal persecution of those responsible for, uh, for uh, rape and sexual violence in, in, in the IH. Um, it's also well known that in our case, in case of Bosnia and promoting uh, and breaking stigma and silence around these stories and issues of rape and sexual violence really was connected quite closely with the role of uh, art, uh, in this case, especially in the role of movie. So um, thanks to the movie, a uh, movie done by the Bosnian director, Jasmin Lajdanic with the name Grbavica, which is speaking about um, the children, kids being born as a product of rape or transgenerational trauma. On 2012, when Jasmin Lajdanic won a Golden Bear in Berlin from uh, screening her film, uh, that was actually a moment when the federal part of our country, our country is divided on two entities, 10 cantons, Brčko district and state level. So to illustrate the country, which is territorial like Washington DC, we have 186 ministries and three presidents. And it's, 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 it's an enormous uh, governmental structure existing. So the federal part of country decided that after this film and, uh, and, and, and you know, promotion of these stories, they, the federal government decided they will compensate the victims of uh, rape and sexual violence as a civil victims of war. So at least some 1,000 uh, women have been claiming their rights and they were able to get compensation. I'm mentioning this because I will speak a little bit about the role we had and the work we did uh, closely with a couple of filmmakers. One of them is uh, Abigail Disney and her film, uh, I came to testify of the PBS episode, Women War and Peace, which is speaking about the braveness of uh, Eastern uh, Bosnian woman from Pocha, who decided they will stand at the International Tribunal and testify against their perpetrators. Thanks to the braveness of these rural women from Eastern Bosnia, they became crime against humanity. And, you know, I'm always trying to kind of highlight the role of, of rural Bosnian women who were mostly housewives who decided they will stood up and look in the face of their perpetrators. And, you know, in this case, the prosecution was able to prove that rape was committed and they did change the international law. The second, uh, so we were, we were producing this documentary and it had an outreach of 11 million people worldwide. The second one is our close work with um, the, the Hollywood actor Angelina Jolie, where we were also helping her to, okay, produce the film, but to create the network of survivors after, you know, she did this feature film and raising awareness about the rape and these women and stigma and silence, we were able to create um, a network among survivors and uh, to spend some you know, like quality time and talked about their need and, you know, what, what potentially can be done. And the result of this collaboration and this work actually was our collaboration uh, with the British government on the launching and creating the international protocol on documenting and investigating a sexual violence. Um, this document is extremely important because it does, you know, give a set of recommendation and uh, uh, and knowledge and best practices from Bosnia, how to document the sexual violence in context. Some lessons learned from Bosnia, some experiences were finally you know, able to be used on a good purpose. And, you know, we did help to launch this protocol, but also to create a set of different projects and, and programs, uh, multimedia programs, helping um, this dry legal document 
is actually uh, find a way also among young people and you know general public. So it's also a lot of, of work related to multimedia and art. So we did curated a couple of uh, outdoor traveling exhibitions, also not featuring only experience from Bosnia, but also bringing the stories from uh, Congo and Darfur and some other parts of the world where you know our young people would have a chance to see that the rape is rape and 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 sexual violence is a global problem that that does exist, but also raising awareness among Balkan men that in a case you know the rape is committed that there is a chance that we can be prosecuted. So a lot of our work was a mix of multimedia and education and actually raising awareness uh, to, to promote the stigma and break the stigma and silence uh, around these topics. So I stop here. Thank you so much, Velma. I think you know your comments uh, bring me back to this idea that impunity begets impunity that we've been talking about and how silence really creates opportunities for these types of gendered violations to uh, to recur in the future. And thank you as well for highlighting how different tools, not just formal transitional justice or accountability mechanisms, um, you know, can disrupt these cycles, but also how more informal tools like film can really play a role in bringing some of these narratives sort of out of the shadows into the public so that they can be dealt with and uh, you know, part of a broader approach to promoting gender justice um, in the future. So thank you for that. All right. Um, so I think now we have maybe about five minutes for a short Q&A session. It's been a really robust discussion. So thank you to all of our, our panelists for that. Um, so I'd like to invite everyone, if you have a question, you can either add it to the chat, as we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, or you can use the tool on Zoom to virtually uh, raise your hand. And I would just ask um, if you do have a question, please let us know if it's directed at a particular panelist. I think to get us started, um, we have one question that's in the chat. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and read, um, read this question. It looks like it's directed toward you, Savita. Um, so this question comes from Noor Wahid from Indonesia. He says that a few weeks ago, he was in Bangladesh and learned a lot about the 1971 genocide before and after the liberation war, as well as the connection with the gross human rights violations that occurred throughout Asia and the Rohingya refugees who to this day suffer uh, under the Myanmar military junta. So he says, as Savita mentioned, the international community is not taking too seriously what is happening in Myanmar today and the impact it is having on the Rohingya refugees who have had to make the long journey to other Asian countries for refuge and again face difficulties there. Could you explain the role of transitional justice in this and how uh, should the international community, especially Asian, respond to this, um, particularly when we know that most Asian countries did not ratify the Convention on Refugees? Um, so, Savita, would you like to start us off with any thoughts in response to that question? Yes, definitely. Uh, I mean, the question is is, is very, uh, uh, very correct in its analysis of what is happening right now in Myanmar and what has happened in Myanmar since 2012. Uh, you know, even if I go back, to, uh, uh, go back to that year, but you know, 2017, the the genocide against the Rohingya, as well as um, the international response after the coup, has been very limited. Um, in terms of sort of the UN Security Council, I mean, not a single resolution on Myanmar has been introduced in the uh, UN Security Council um, after the Rohingya genocide or after the coup. I mean, we have uh, recently we have had a, 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 a resolution, but that's again. You know, lacks um, punitive action against this uh, this this military junta, and you know when we see international structures failing, um, you know we also have to look towards the region that we come from, and you know ASEAN did come out with a five point uh, uh, process through which they wanted the junta to sort of you know look at how they were responding to the coup and sort of you know 
put some parameters around how they should sort of, you know, um, uh, protect their own populations. But the Myanmar government has um, ignored it. You know, we have uh, thousands dead and over 1,500 to 1,800 people who are detained. I mean, I think that it's in thousands. I'm sorry, maybe I'm wrong on numbers. Um, and, um, you know, the transitional justice processes, I mean, that are underway, I mean, are, we have the case which that Gambia took Myanmar to the International Court of Justice, but that's holding Myanmar as a state responsible. I think it's one step towards the larger sort of transitional justice processes, truth telling, um, safe and secure return of the Rohingya back to uh, Myanmar, uh, res resumption of a democratic uh, government uh, in Myanmar. So there, there are many different factors which have to come into play uh, for us to think about sort of a very holistic form of justice. But in terms of just the refugee issue, I would say that, you know, within the responsibility to protect, uh, providing refuge to populations that are um, seeking refuge because of the fact that there are atrocities happening in their um, uh, countries or because they are they themselves are uh, victims of atrocity crimes is part of pillar three, it's part of pillar one, it's part of your responsibility ability um, to protect. And, you know, what we are seeing is that, you know, except for the case of Bangladesh, which has upheld its responsibility and has provided refuge to over a million Rohingyas, the rest of the region is consistently failing them. Thank you so much, Savita. And I see we have uh, one hand raised from Shana Lewis. Um, so I'm not sure, Camilla, if you could help <laughs> unmute Shana and let her closer question, that would be great. Um, Shana, you can go ahead and unmute yourself if you're able to. I think you should be able to unmute yourself now if you can hear me. <laughs> Hmm. All right. Um, okay, if you're having trouble maybe unmuting yourself, Shana, you could place the question in the Q and A session, and we can we can try to address it there. But I am um, just conscious of the time at the moment, and know we're getting close to the end of our our hour and a half. So, since I don't see any other hands raised or any. Um, any other questions in the chat at the moment, I'd like to turn back to our panelists and just give each of you, let's uh, have one minute for any concluding uh, remarks or, or thoughts you might wanna share just coming out of today's conversation. So uh, Savita, why don't we start with you, if that's okay? Yeah, thank you so much uh, for inviting me again. I mean, I think that it was so great to listen to all of these different perspectives and just building on Valma's point that, you know, I mean, going back to sexual and gender-based violence, I think silence is such a big um, uh, enemy of, of this particular crime and, and the way, you know, not only particular societies, but I feel that looking at the world, every society is structured that um, we actually do not want to face or deal with these crimes. But um, if we don't deal with these crimes, we are truly sort of uh, attacking the, the fabric of our culture um, and, and then fabric of sort of, you know, how societies can heal. Uh, so I really like the point that that she made. And again, you know, really impressed with the work that everybody else is doing on providing psychosocial support and documentation uh, and archiving, which is so important because, you know, as Patrick said that, um, you know, because there were some cases which went to court, a lot of documents came out which would have otherwise not been um, be able to reveal, reveal uh, because they had to be shown as evidence or they had to you know um, showcase those documents. So in the same way, within the international community, we really need to support. Um, we need to really support attempts made at collecting evidence and preserving evidence and, and training civil society to do this in a way that doesn't re-traumatize or traumatize communities, but actually sort of, you know, uh, can then be used for future accountability mechanisms. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, Savita. Um, Velma, could we turn to you next if you have a, any concluding thoughts to share? Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Savita. And I mean, everything what you appointed for me really did help, you know, my presentation so that I don't repeat, but I agree completely. What I would like to mention maybe briefly at the end uh, is um, also through our work and the knowledge we have in working in the genocide prevention field and mass atrocities, especially together with our colleagues uh, from the region of Western Balkan, I mean, in, in the coalition we established together with United Nations Office of Special Advisor for Genocide Prevention and Responsibility to Protect. It's also extremely important to engage civil society and NGO sector on a larger scale and create the coalitions we at the Balkans, and we work closely with, with PEJA and with, uh, with, uh, with the fund. We, uh, we do know how much is necessary actually to learn about the mechanisms of genocide prevention and mass atrocities. Also to support each other's work, to support and lift up uh, our work, create a joint action and coalitions and actually respond together because civil society, at least in the IH and the region currently is leading all these, the most important efforts, including the education, which I was speaking about, the processes of memorialization, which is a huge issue. Again, in Bosnia, there is no state law which will regulate on which way we will commemorate the past. There is only one institution, state institution of memory, not being established by the willingness of local politicians, by the special decision of international community, in this case, the high representative. So I'm going to, yeah, the mention and a point again, necessity of us to collaborating and supporting our work and also learning about the mechanisms and helping each other to together to achieve, hopefully this larger idea of preventing uh, future crimes and conflict. And that is why also the seminar and work you do, Sarah, is extremely important by bringing us together and giving us opportunity to share the knowledge and expertise. So I stop here, thank you. Thank you so much, Velma. And Peja, um, we'll go to you next if you have any concluding thoughts. Thank you, Sarah. Well, uh, I'm not so, you know, good like, like having some, you know, like a theoretic kind of conclusion, but yeah, I, I would like to say, you uh, know, while I was preparing for this uh, webinar, I was thinking about, you know, from your question that, you know, there are so many witness statements uh, collected by Humanitarian Law Center. And I, it's not just the record of statements, you know, that, uh, that it's, you know, now they are saved and preserved. It's also a touch with the people, you know, that uh, lost somebody, you know, or had some kind of violation towards them. And, you know, in most of the situation, nobody cares about them, you know, not the state, not everybody. So the small changes that we are making in our when I say um, a micro universe, you know, but by, you know, letting people know that, you know, it's not normal thing to lose somebody and, you know, nobody comes with any kind of, you know, kind of reparation for you. And, you know, uh, people must learn to value more their lives in order to prevent the future kind of, you know, so it's not just going with the tide, like, okay, tomorrow is, you know, disaster, something new is coming. And then people have to stand up and say, we don't want to, you know, be included in that. So, I just want to say that, you know, those people that we have contacted, you know, they were, you know, touched by that somebody is caring for them, somebody is asking, you know, so there was some referrals in that regard, maybe later we helped them to get some, you know, kind of confirmation or legal thing, or, you know, there was a communication that was ongoing. So I think that preservation of this kind of connection with the people is something that we can do on, you know, our, you know, uh, local regional level so that we can make some uh, change that would be, you know, global in a, in a way that we are trying to prevent future atrocities. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Peja. Um, and then Anna, last but not least, if you have uh, any concluding thoughts to share. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, perhaps just to underscore um, what has been said by everyone, when we are dealing with atrocity prevention, it's important to really adopt a multi a multidisciplinary approach to it, uh, not only the, the, the justice and accountability approach, which is really important, right, bringing perpetrators to book to guarantee non-recurrence, but guaranteeing non-recurrence, for instance, of conflicts and atrocity really requires that we also deal um, with the psychosocial dimensions of, of brutalization uh, because, particularly because when we uh, omit dealing with the self and with the trauma 
and what it presents, for instance, and particularly its, its impacts, which can be psychological, which can be physical and, 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 and neurological, as well as um, perhaps socioeconomic as well, um, then we, we, if we don't address this aspect of victimization, we easily can fall into uh, this cycle of today's victims becoming tomorrow's perpetrators and thereby um, um, uh, uh, nurturing conflicts as opposed to us really preventing it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I think that's the perfect idea for us to wrap up on the need for this really holistic and, and multidisciplinary approach and to look at the links between these two fields, atrocity prevention and transitional justice, and the ways in which both can be both forward and backward looking at the same time. So, so thank you for that. Um, as we wrap up, I just want to take a moment to say uh, we'd be very grateful if those of you still with us could participate in a very brief anonymous poll about today's session, uh, which helps inform our future programming and approaches to these webinars. So you should have um, a brief poll on your screen now. All right, um, so thank you all for that. And as we, as we close, I would just like to remind everyone to please visit our events page on our Sites of Conscience website where you can find recordings of old webinars and of course, upcoming webinars. Uh, you can also find a selection of recently released policy briefs with more information on some of the topics we've just been discussing that, that Anna and Peja mentioned uh, through our GIJTR website. So with that, I'd like to say a big thank you once again to all four of our panelists for bringing these diverse perspectives um, and all of your insights and experiences to our conversation today. It's been a pleasure uh, speaking with all of you and learning from you. Um, and thank you as well to everyone else who's joined us. I hope um, that we'll all have a chance to meet again virtually or in person soon. Uh, so thank you everyone. Goodbye.